Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to our webinar presentation today, Human Factors and Product Liability Cases. Please do note that the presentation will be audio broadcast into your computer speakers, so please make sure that your speakers are turned on and that the volume is set at a reasonable level. We will be starting very shortly and promptly at 2 o'clock, and again, thank you for attending our presentation today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, for our presentation of human factors, product liability, and to error is human. Um, our presenter today is Mr. Will Nelson. Mr. Nelson has over 30 years of experience in ergonomics, biomechanics, and human factors. His, his expertise in areas of specialization include product liability, personal injury, premises liability, and accident reconstruction. Of particular interest to Mr. Nelson are the emerging research in the are the, are the emerging researches in the areas of driver distraction, sports injuries, and medical errors, and how to help prevent injuries. 
Today's webinar is designed to discuss how human factors can impact on human error, discuss human factors models, and the effect of human factors and product liability. It will address what human factors is and the study of the interrelationships between humans, the tools they use, and the environment in which they live. We will discuss how these interrelationships affect product liability issues such as design, engineering, manufacturing, maintenance, instructions, and warnings, and intended and foreseeable use and misuse. If you have any questions today, uh, we'll welcome your questions, and we would ask that you use the chat feature, which is located to the right of your screen. And we will be taking intermittent, change, uh, intermittent breaks excuse me, during the presentation so that he can respond to you. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to an archived recording of the webinar and a link to the PowerPoint presentation. So please look for those in your inboxes. Also, before leaving the presentation today, I ask that you take the time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program. And let me remind you that if you are applying for CLE credit, please complete the survey at the end of the presentation. I will now be turning the, to the program over to our dis distinguished presenter, Mr. Will Nelson. Will, the program is now yours. Thank you, Carol. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to present today. Uh, we have a very uh, timely topic of human factors uh, with the recent plane crash in San Francisco and uh, also uh, what's been going on over the last uh, year or so with the uh, NFL and football helmets and concussion cases. Obviously, the whole area of human factors, product design, warnings, labeling uh, is a uh, timely topic, and um, I hope that uh, at the end of today's webinar that uh, all the participants will come away with at least um, a little better understanding of what human factors is and how it can apply to uh, product liability cases. Uh, this uh, particular uh, webinar on product liability is part of a series that we've done with uh, TASA. Uh, some of the previous ones, just an overview of human factors. We've done one on medical errors, one on distracted driving and workplace injuries. And um, hope that uh, this one is as enlightening as uh, some of the others that we've done with TASA. Uh, today we will start with just a little bit of time spent on uh, an overview of what is human factors, and we'll go into anthropometry, human error, and then various human factors models. And then the whole second half of the uh, webinar, we'll actually be talking in more specific about uh, warnings, uh, warnings and labels, and then also uh, five or six different examples of products and some of the issues that those products face uh, as they uh, go through the design, engineering, instruction, uh, and warning uh, uh, aspects of the various products themselves. The examples that we will talk about include uh, a nail gun, trampoline, kitchen knife, table saw, fire extinguisher cabinet, uh, and then helmet. Let's first start with just what is uh, human factors. In the United States, human factors and the word ergonomics are used uh, synonymous. Uh, the ergo uh, means work, and uh, nomus means rules or laws. So basically what we're looking at is how people work, what they do, whether that's in a workplace or whether it's uh, an athlete and what that person is, is doing, uh, or uh, a consumer and the product they're using, or a professional and the various uh, tools or equipment that they're working with. Uh, it has a uh, long uh, history. It actually uh, goes all the way back. It was mentioned in the 1700s, uh, Ramazzini. And then uh, in the United States, it really became popular uh, or uh, became in, in much greater use uh, during World War II and then in the Vietnam War. Let's first start with what is human error. Human error is just an action or a decision that results in one or more unintended negative outcomes. Very simple uh, definition.
generally the simpler the task and the less number of people involved, the less likelihood of an error to occur. Obviously, this uh, seems reasonable to most people, that as you uh, increase the complexity of a task or the number of people, obviously the uh, assumption would be that that would increase the likelihood of error. Let's talk briefly about what machines are, are good at, and then we'll talk uh, uh, about what humans are good at. Um, one thing in particular is that uh, computer-controlled machines and machines in general can do parallel processing, which allows multitasking. This is key since humans really can't do multitasking. Humans can do rapid task switching, but not true multitasking, as it shows every day by drivers who try to uh, drive and text or uh, people walking and texting and running into things. Other things that machines are good at is Routine, repetitive, and very precise operations. Obviously, they can exert great force. You see that a lot with construction equipment. Or they can work in hostile environments uh, that uh, you just don't want people to uh, be involved with. There are many things that humans are good at. Um, we are hearing uh, a lot about the emerging area uh, with the NSA and connecting the dots using artificial intelligence. Uh, while robotics and intelligence systems are uh, challenging some of the basic fundamentals that, uh, of what people are good at, uh, still at the end of the day when you get involved with uh, all the data that is gathered and the analysis that is done, it usually is people who make the final de determination and decision. Uh, which is listed here is the ability to exercise judgment where events cannot be completely defined or to perceive the patterns and making generalizations about those patterns. And obviously, as technology uh, advances, it uh, blurs the line of what machines are good at versus what humans are good at. Uh, but even at the end of the day, all the programming that goes into those computers is, is done by humans. So the uh, computers that control the machines or the products that are made, uh, at the end of the day, it still requires input from humans at some level or at some stage of the process. So the best solution, as you would expect, usually involves both humans and machines at some level to create the desired result. And so consequently, human factors is the study of the interrelationship between people, the tools they use, or the products that they use, and the environment in which they live and work and use those products. Much of the work in human factors is on improving this system of human tools and environment interface by designing products with less hazards, easier to use, and requiring less maintenance. A good example of this is uh, I just recently purchased a new car, and as I've done for the last 40-some years, I uh, was filling up with gas and uh, popped the hood and was wanting to check the oil, and I literally spent 10 minutes looking for the dipstick to check the oil. And I just knew that there had to be a dipstick there because there had been one for every car that I've ever owned. And lo and behold, found out that uh, there was not a dipstick, that it's all done electronically on this vehicle, and it just tells you when you need to check the oil. So uh, looking at that from a uh, interface of a person and the, the product, the vehicle, and the environment of driving, uh, one can very quickly see that by eliminating the need for the consumer to have to open the hood of the car, you have engineered out a problem uh, or hazards of exposing the person to, one is, the uh, toxicity of the oil itself, the possibility of getting uh, cut by or trapped by a moving part, whether it's a fan or a belt, or being burned by the, the heat of the engine. And it also eliminates the uh, need for a warning uh, since uh, you wouldn't necessarily be looking under the hood for that application of checking the oil. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, in some future slides in more detail. Let's talk very briefly here about anthropometry. It's really very simply, it's the measurement of human beings, uh, it's the various measurements of their uh, height, 
their girth, their various uh, segments of the body, the legs, the arms, uh, the center of gravity of each of the different segments of the body. And, of course, anytime you're designing products or looking at products or uh, a person and what tools they're using or how they work, anthropometry is a key part of that. Considerations when you look at uh, anthropometry and making decisions on a product and, and how it's designed or engineered have to take into consideration the person's clothing that they will be wearing uh, at the time of the use of that product, uh, whether those are gloves or shoes, whether they have wearing a helmet. And then you also have to look at what type of design or engineering criteria do you need to design around. And, for example, do you design for the very minimum, meaning the one percentile of the population, or do you design all the way to the other extreme for the 99th percentile? Uh, to give some examples uh, of designing for the minimum, or basically the uh, smallest or shortest people, uh, would be, let's say, a push buttons uh, for the floor inside of an elevator. You Obviously, if uh, a person in a wheelchair can access those buttons, then a person uh, standing up without too much trouble or difficulty can bend over and reach those same buttons. An example of designing for the maximum or the tallest would be uh, opening the height of a door frame, because obviously if a very tall person can get through that door frame, then the short person can also get through that door frame. An example of designing for the average would be a checkout counter at a grocery store. Uh, obviously, uh, it's going to be low for some people, but high for some others, but in general, it, it reaches a good broad section of people being able to reach the uh, the counter and put the groceries on the, uh, the uh, belt in order for to be checked out. And an example of designing for the range of extremes would be uh, an office chair that is designed to go up and down and has a lot of uh, variety of uh, positions, or even the seat in a vehicle that uh, goes forward and back, up and down, has lumbar support, and the uh, seat back itself goes back and, uh, and forth. Uh, so let me give some examples of how you can design and that becomes critical in the design and engineering phase of, again, who you're designing for, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, too. So the six major areas of human factors focus with product liability include the design of the product, engineering of that product, the manufacturing and maintenance of the product, and then what instructions and warnings uh, go along with that product. We will touch on each of those over the next several slides. OSHA requires a hazard control hierarchy uh, from the most preferred to the least preferred in dealing with a hazard. Now, while OSHA does not generally get involved with products specifically since they're focused on workplace safety, but the same hierarchy is applicable to products themselves. And the example uh, that I gave earlier about uh, the car without the uh, oil dipstick, uh, again, is a perfect example of how during the engineering and design process, they engineered out the hazard by taking away the need for the consumer to get under the hood of a car and check the oil. Uh, so obviously, engineering out the hazard is the preferred way. However, if because of the design of the product that it's not able to engineer out the hazard, you guard against the hazard, and then, at the very least, warn about the hazard itself. Let's talk about the uh, design element. The key here is to know who the intended user is. That drives the entire design and engineering process. Who's the user? What is the intended use of this product? Is it more than one type of a use, or is it just a single use? Uh, how will it be used? Who will be using it? And that literally is the starting point and the drive uh, when a product is being engineered. Engineering is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the product specifications are developed, which drive the cost uh, and the production. 
What may appear as a small decision during this phase can lead to disastrous results down the road. Examples of this are everywhere. When you look at the safety recall of products that you see, mainly vehicles, but even consumer products, uh, you see premature product failures in the marketplace all the time. Uh, it usually starts in the engineering area where you get involved with looking at the trade-offs and the balance between the cost of the item uh, and all the other trade-offs that take place in the uh, of what materials you use, how that product is intended to be used, as well as um, uh, looking at how that product could be misused or can somebody use it for something that it was not initially intended for, uh, that also should be taken into consideration at this phase. Obviously, looking at uh, any standards, codes, or regulations is important during this phase. And what's uh, significant in the manufacturing is what quality control processes are being used does the company even have a quality control program? What standards are they using? What ISO? Or are they using specific process control, et cetera? Uh, to understand how do they identify whether that product is truly being manufactured to the design and engineering specification. Maintenance is usually an afterthought, which can lead to the exposure of many hazards not only to the user of the product, but the person who has to maintain that product. Uh, maintenance manuals can be poorly written, not cover the necessary topics to prevent exposure to unknown hazards. Unknown hazard meaning unknown to the person who's maintaining it, but hazards that should be known to the manufacturer of the product uh, and should be disclosed and explained, uh, and again, either engineered out, guarded against, or warned about in the appropriate manner. And needless to say, warnings are an important area in product liability claims. We will go into more detail on this in the second half and, and talk about the uh, elements that goes into a good warning. Common sense. We hear this quite a bit. Uh, common sense. Somebody should have known uh, that this hazard existed or should have known how to use this product. Uh, the complexity of the world today as uh, technology advances and as the world becomes uh, smaller and we travel more, common sense never did really exist. It definitely doesn't exist today. Our society is too complex with multi-ethnic, multicultural, multiracial, diversity, backgrounds, brings different knowledge, understanding, and expectations to a product. This, again, gets back to what I would mentioned at the very start. <clears throat> who is that product designed for and for what purpose? And that drives uh, everything relative to the uh, design of the product, engineering, the manufacturing process. It starts right there. It has been estimated that on average 60 to 80 percent of accidents involve human error. But those may have been preventab preventable had the system been better, had the uh, folks, the people who designed, engineered, and manufactured the product, had they thought through in more detail of, again, how that product is being used and who is going to use that product, how then do you protect that person from the hazards that are uh, associated with that product? Law of unintended consequences, <clears throat> the key here that I wanted to uh, point out has to do with new technology. Again, having to do with the rapid emergence of new technology in our society, uh, and it doesn't show any signs it's going to be letting up. Uh, cars get more complex and are getting to the point, uh, you know, Google's testing driverless cars right now, uh, smartphones, uh, when you look at uh, the effect of smartphones and people texting and trying to drive or texting and walking, obviously the unintended consequences of that of uh, 
people not understanding the effect that it would have on driving, uh, the complexity of vehicles with all the various technologies that control the uh, engine speed going around corners, uh, controls the steering wheel, uh, lights, uh, headlights that can turn around corners. Very few people really understand the complexity of the vehicle that they're driving today. And that makes a real challenge then for engineers and designers to come up with simpler ways to get that information across uh, so that uh, the user of that product can understand the product and can uh, use the product, uh, again, in its intended way. Another example is uh, you know, football helmets where uh, it reduces skull fracture but has increased the risk of uh, traumatic brain injury and concussions as a result of uh, unintended consequences of the helmet protecting the head so well for skull fractures that some football players were using it actually uh, as part of the uh, tackling itself rather than protection for the head. talked about that. Let's talk about a little bit about the types of human error and the causes of those. Um, two types that uh, you may hear about or have heard about is active errors and latent errors. Active errors are occur at the level of the operator and their effects are felt almost immediately. Where latent errors tend to be removed from the direct control of the operator. They could be uh, hazards that are latent within the product itself, and uh, that product has been used by many, many people and has never had a problem, and then all of a sudden uh, somebody gets hurt by that product. That's just because that uh, error or that hazard that resulted in the error or the incident uh, has not affected people for many, many years does not mean that that hazard doesn't exist and that that hazard should have either been engineered out, guarded against, or warned about with that product. And generally, latent errors are a result of poor design, faulty maintenance, uh, or um, you know, if you get in looking at the organization itself as opposed to the product specific, you can see bad management decisions or poorly structured organizations for accountability and responsibility in decision making. There are also errors of omission and errors of commission. Errors of omission is failing to perform a uh, specific action. Errors of commission are performing the wrong action. In a medical setting, research studies have uh, indicated that up to 90 plus percent of errors are classified as uh, errors of omission compared to errors of commission, uh, which helps then to look at where the focus should be from an analysis standpoint to prevent uh, product uh, injuries as a result of hazards in products and their design. So the basic purpose of a human factors analysis is not to find where people went wrong, but is to understand why their assessments and actions made sense at the time. And what you find is when you uh, when one goes in and talks to people about what happened and what they were doing, in their minds at the time, it made sense for the actions that they took uh, relative to either hazards that they didn't know about or hazards that they may have known about that did not appreciate the, uh, the level of risk or the type of hazard and the effect and consequences of uh, that hazard, uh, exposing themselves to that hazard. So the view of human factors analysis is to avoid judging people. It wants to go beyond saying what people should have noticed or could have done. Instead, the view is to try to explain why that incident happened and then try to understand uh, its causes and how it could have been prevented uh, in the, 
either in the future or could have been prevented uh, early on in the design and engineering phase of that product. Again, on, on this slide, <clears throat> when you look at complex systems, Human error is not the conclusion of an investigation. It is the starting point. Uh, and again, you, if you followed the uh, airplane crash out in San Francisco, uh, every time that the uh, National Transportation Safety Administration uh, folks were interviewed, they would always talk about that they were in data gathering phase. They were gathering information and it was too early. They really want to, they know what happened, now they're trying to understand what, uh, why it occurred and how it could have been prevented for the future. And that takes time. We like to separate out accidents from incidents. Uh, an accident is an event occurring by chance or from unknown causes. An incident is an occurrence that is a separate unit of experience. And a lot of people will tend to call uh, car collisions uh, an accident, a car accident. Generally, they are not accidents, but they are incidents. There's nothing accidental about it. There is a cause, and, uh, whether it's a human error, whether it's a product failure, product design, Somewhere in that system uh, between the person, the use of that product, and the end result, an error occurred and an incident uh, occurred, and there is an explanation of why that incident occurred. Most people have heard of Murphy's Law. We believe that this is a corollary. What can go wrong usually goes right, but then we draw the wrong conclusion. The unit kind of gets back to hazards uh, that people are exposed to all the time. And hundreds of thousands or millions of people can be exposed to that hazard and nothing happens. And people assume then that uh, the hazard is either not existent or that uh, it's such a low risk or the consequences are so low. And then that's when somebody gets hurt. That doesn't mean that the hazard wasn't there. It just means that the right situation did not occur for that hazard to uh, uh, cause a, an incident. And, again, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see with the um, uh, airplane crash in San Francisco exactly what the uh, results of the human factors analysis will say on that flight, uh, whether it had to do with the pilot error uh, or whether it had to do with uh, the control system or just what uh, uh, or a combination of the two um, that brought that plane in uh, too low. Think, uh, with the time, we'll skip a few slides here and uh, get right to the uh, first half questions. And then we'll dive right into warnings and labels and uh, some examples. So uh, I'll be glad to take any questions at this point. Okay. Um, well, I do have a couple of questions for you. And the first one is, how can an attorney decide if a human factors analysis would be helpful on a case? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Any time that there is a product and a uh, personal injury uh, it does well to at least consider whether human factors is a part of the overall um, investigation. Um, Any time that there's that interface between the person, the product, and the environment, and the use of it, um, without looking at just looking at the product itself and not looking at how the human interfaces with that we think is a uh, missed opportunity for uh, attorneys to uh, get a full understanding and appreciation of the incident and how it occurred and whether it could have been prevented or not. Okay.
Okay, and then the second question is, has human factors been recognized by the federal courts um, and also uh, Daubert challenge? Oh, yes, most definitely, yes. Uh, again, the science itself goes uh, way back, uh, became uh, popularized in the United States uh, after World War II and uh, in the Vietnam War, and it's um, used throughout the United States and the world. Uh, Federal courts uh, recognize it. Uh, state courts recognize it. Uh, sometimes you'll find some judges who have not heard of the term, uh, and it's just a matter of uh, educating them. In some cases, uh, they've heard uh, synonymous terms like under industrial engineering. Sometimes human factors will fall, uh, or um, under psychology, uh, human factors will fall. Uh, so a lot. Uh, of times if it not heard of an alternative term such as ergonomics or uh, one of the other um, sister disciplines uh, a uh, judge may have heard of that uh, then understands more of how human factors that can relate to the case. Okay, and I have another question. This question is from Gary. Uh, is it possible to quantify the probability of human error in the use of a product? Uh, very good question. Um, quantify the probability of human error. Um, I think we'd have to look at the specific situation and just see what research may have been done on that product, if any. Uh, depending on the device, for example, if you look at a medical device, the FDA requires that human factors analysis be done on that product. Uh, it's generally not required for uh, consumer products. Uh, some products are, that are used in the workplace require it. Uh, but as far as quantifying the uh, probability of human error, We'd have to look at very specifically at the product itself and the situation and see if some research has been done in that area. Okay, thanks, Will. And then this is the last question for this section, and then we'll move on with the rest of the presentation. So the question is, are there degrees and or certifications that cover human factors specifically? Uh, yes, there are. There's the Board of Certification as well as the uh, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, and the, um, there's an international association also. I see there's a, a question here from Robert. Please elaborate, please elaborate further on the proposition that human error is not a cause of an incident. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I stated that. If I did, then it was not meant in that term. Human error uh, can definitely be the cause of a uh, incident. What I was discussing, though, was from the standpoint that you have to look at the entire system and look at how that person uh, uh, interfaces with the product and all the elements that goes into that of the product design, who it was intended for, engineering of that product, uh, the instructions and training, maintenance, all of those are uh, aspects that goes into the analysis also. But no, the, the human error uh, is a uh, key element in that uh, in the use of the human, as I mentioned with the plane crash out in uh, San Francisco. Okay, I think, well, those are the questions for this section, so we can continue on with the presentation. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, warnings. I'm sure we all know employees who should be wrapped up with caution tape. Seems like there's uh, some people that uh, are just uh, prone to injury, and there's uh, research been done uh, in that area and um, uh, discusses a little bit about types of people who are more prone to injury than others, but uh, that's not the, the purpose of this presentation. I just thought it made a good slide for somebody inside of an elevator to uh, protect them from getting hurt. All right, so 
Safety communication is used to inform people about hazards so that undesirable consequences are avoided or minimized. There are many different kinds of warnings. They could be anything ranging from signs and placards, labels, uh, inserts, manuals, tags. Uh, it could even be audio, videotapes, or face-to-face -face verbal instructions. But the key elements of a warning include the hazard level. In this case, it's actually a warning as opposed to a uh, hazard, as opposed to a caution or a danger. Identify what the uh, hazard is. Identify the, um, the consequences of the interaction with the hazard. And how to avoid the hazard. And then on the other side, we have a graphic symbol of the consequences of uh, interacting with the hazard also. Just on that one warning, were many of these elements that are considered as part of the design of a adequate warning label or warning itself. The font, the size of that font, the colors, the shape of the uh, label, the legibility, which is re whether it's recognizable or not, the readability, whether it's comprehensible or not, the graphic symbol, the layout, uh, the illumination of it, uh, how to deal with curved surfaces. All of these are elements that uh, have to be taken into consideration when designing a visual warning. I use this as just an example. We're all very familiar, obviously, with the uh, stop sign. And this is just used to illustrate how a very simple change can have a drastic consequence in the outcome. And if you take a, a stop sign, which is very simple, but yet it has uh, a very clear font, uh, a graphic sh uh, symbol, the shape, the red, uh, all of those go into your interpretation of what to do when you see one. And a simple change of making that shape, keeping the shape the same, but changing it to green and putting the words go, as you could imagine, would create uh, havoc at an intersection. And it would be real interesting to see whether people would actually stop or whether they would go or whether they would stop and then go. Uh, just by making a little change, but it goes to show how a simple change can create vast confusion. Okay, so there's four main purposes uh, of a warning. Communicate important safety information. Hopefully influence or modify a person's behavior. Reduce or prevent health problems, workplace accidents, personal injury and serve as a reminder to persons who may already know the information about the hazard. So let's talk about uh, some examples here. And I'm, uh, these examples are uh, just literally uh, some learning examples. I'm not uh, talking about any specific case or situation. Let's take an example of a nail gun that was designed for professionals. Uh, it uh, is, uh, requires specialized training to operate. You have to have a, a compressed air tank, be able to connect it, and have uh, a certain amount of air pressure to operate it. Take special type of nails that uh, um, go into it. And the size of the nail gun ranges anywhere from a small finishing nail, roofing nails, framing nails. And as you can imagine, framing nails would take a lot of a lot bigger nail gun, and also a lot more air pressure to operate properly. Let's talk about a roofing situation where the nail gun is used in a, what is called a bump process where basically you keep your finger on the trigger and every time the tip of the nail gun contacts a, the roofing surface, a nail is fired. Obviously, this could uh, make it easier to uh, operate because you don't have to pull the trigger every time. And if you're working on the roof, 
the specific location of the nail is not near as important as it is in a finishing nail. And so uh, a worker could very quickly get that uh, the nail uh, and be very efficient and very productive in using the nail gun and contacting the surface. Well, let's discuss a little bit about what happens, though, when you take that type of a nail gun and put that in the hands of a consumer. We're all familiar over the last 20 years with the uh, increase in the number of Lowe's and Home Depots around the country. And nail guns are marketed to not only professionals, but also uh, to consumers. There's nothing to uh, prevent anybody from basically going and buying a nail gun. And you take that same nail gun, you put it in the hands of a consumer uh, who says, yeah, I think I could, uh, you know, use this. It really doesn't have much knowledge uh, on the use of the product or understanding of how it operates. And they're in the process of using it. Uh, they've uh, put a nail in. They've left their finger on the trigger. And they turn around when uh, they get startled by either their son or somebody uh, comes up next to them. They turn around and accidentally the nail gun fires and puts a nail into somebody. Well, this is a situation where, as I mentioned at the very start, where you have to look at the nail gun and who it was intended for. At the very start, it was really intended for a professional, somebody who's trained, somebody who uh, appreciates its danger and its hazard. And in the hands of a consumer, uh, this product with this type of a feature, a bump uh, capability, is probably not uh, the best type of feature they have. So then the question becomes, how do you change that nail gun to turn it into a consumer, or can you engineer it out? Can you guard against it, or do you just strictly warn about it? And um, in this situation, it would be very easy to engineer that out, take that feature out, and uh, make that as an optional feature or one that uh, you would have to change some mechanism within the nail gun in order for that activity to take place. Or you come out with a consumer model and also a professional model. Uh, that way that you can distinguish between the type of product and where it is sold uh, for professionals versus the product that is sold to consumers. And you can then change the way that the instruction manual is uh, designed and written and the type of warnings that you warn about, again, based off the intended user. So this is a situation where, uh, again, knowing exactly who that product is designed for is critical because that drives the entire process of how it's engineered, what features it has, uh, and what channels of distribution it's going to be sold in and who it would ultimately be sold to. All right, now this is uh, a little different example of a table saw because the inherent nature of the table saw is to cut. So obviously if you eliminate the ability of the saw blade to cut, you've eliminated the functionality of the product itself, which uh, is obviously not uh, possible if you want to kill a cut wood. However, this is an example of a product that, while it can not necessarily be engineered out, it can be guarded against and also warned about the hazard. And you've seen the evolution over the last 20-some uh, years of the types of guards. Uh, a table saw, when they first had guards put on, you couldn't do certain types of wood and you have to take the guard off in order to cut that type of wood. Now the types of guards that are installed are much more flexible and uh, provide much more protection. Uh, there's even uh, some patented technology out there that's been demonstrated that if you took a hot dog and actually uh, put the hot dog up to the saw blade, it would immediately shut down the saw blade, and uh, you might get cut a little bit, but it wouldn't cut your finger off. Again, it kind of shows the evolution of no guard to early guards to today's guard being more sophisticated to uh, possible technology in the future. Uh, and again, in this situation, how that guard is designed, how it is uh, installed, and warning about the hazard all becomes very critical into the design and functionality of this product. And this product, which is a uh, cabinet for a fire extinguisher, uh, in a uh, situation where 
there's different types of glass or plastic that can be inserted into this cabinet. And I show uh, on the right there a uh, one with a plastic uh, molded uh, lens cover. The one on the left has just plate glass. This is a situation where uh, there is a school installation. Uh, there was no code that specifically required any uh, particular type of a uh, lens or even if there had to be a lens. Uh, a uh, person put their uh, arm through it, and uh, there was nothing in the school codes. There was nothing in the uh, building codes that indicated that. There's nothing from the manufacturer that indicated a specific type of glass. So the question becomes, again, back to what was it, its intended use? Does it make sense to put plate glass in a cabinet that is going to be in a school environment where you have kids who... Uh, may get pushed or shoved or uh, fall into it, uh, does it make sense, regardless of what the codes and regulations and standards would be, for this application for this product to not have either plastic or tempered glass or a much smaller opening to be able to see that there, yes, is a fire extinguisher, but does it need to be glass all the way? So this is the appropriate use of a product for a specific application. Uh, and it, again, would not make sense to warn about it with a label because it still would be plate glass. How do you guard against it? Well, you know, I guess you could uh, cover the glass up mainly and only have a very little bit exposed, but the real answer in this situation, again, is to engineer out the problem by going to either a plastic or minimizing the size of the opening so that you can still see the fire extinguisher, but you basically protected it from somebody getting injured. All right, this is one that, uh, again, uh, there's no warning and it's not needed. This is considered open and obvious. The knife has to cut. It was designed to cut. Uh, again, people are familiar with knives and what their purpose is. So it does not make sense. You cannot engineer out the hazard. Uh, you can guard against it as far as where you store your knives, uh, but you can't really, it doesn't make sense that you'd have to warn about the sharp edge of a knife in this situation. All right, this is an example. Is it possible to make a trampoline really acceptable from a risk standpoint? Again, um, obviously the manufacturer thinks that it is. They've come up with nets that are around it and warning signs that go on it. Uh, but the question is, is that uh, when you look at the injuries from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, most of the net, most of the injuries that occur are still on the trampoline and not falling off of the trampoline. So if you have a net, it may prevent somebody from falling off the trampoline, but that still doesn't uh, eliminate the injuries associated with jumping on the trampoline itself and landing on your neck and uh, resulting in neck injury. So the question becomes, is this a product that uh, should be on the market? Uh, is there a way to make it safer? Uh, some of the physician groups have come out and actually said that the product uh, should not even be on the market itself. Uh, is it acceptable to warn about it uh, when the primary use is by children as opposed to adults? Is it reasonable to expect that an adult would provide supervision to a child while they're playing on the trampoline? Is it expected that only one person at a time would be using the trampoline when the reality is that uh, it seems like more than one uh, child at a time gets up there because that makes it more fun. So it gets all involved in the, the aspects of the product, the design of the product, again, who it's intended for, and uh, the amount of risk associated with the use of this product by the intended user. And is it possible then to actually engineer out, guard against it, or warn about it appropriately? And the last example here is just various types of helmets. Some of the issues from a human factor standpoint gets involved with compliance, meaning the use of the helmet. Um, there are some studies that have indicated that when people are um, protected by various safety devices, uh, some of the research involving bicyclists and also with cars, that when you have seat belts, shoulder harnesses, airbags, side airbags, roof airbags, crush zones, all the various safety features, 
that sometimes drivers actually take more risk because they think that they have so many safety features involved that they can take those risks, and if something, an incident happens, the likelihood of them getting hurt is very low. And the same could be said about whether with uh, bicycle helmets uh, and football helmets. Uh, looking again, as I mentioned earlier, about football helmets, and um, they have done a great job of protecting the skull, which is what their intended uh, initial design was for. Uh, but how does that then relate to some of the issues today, questions about concussions and TBIs? Uh, football helmets are designed for multiple impacts, where a bicycle helmet is designed for a sim single impact. How do you know if your bicycle helmet has been, um, uh, been uh, damaged and needs to be replaced? How do you ensure that it's worn properly and fit properly? Uh, and then do you legislate uh, the use of the helmets, or do you um, just recommend their use? A lot of issues in the helmets. Uh, that our society has uh, wrestled with over the years and varies by the state law in some cities uh, in looking at helmets and how do you engineer those helmets, how do you uh, warn about the use of the helmets and what they're intended for but not intended for, uh, and what do you do about those hazards that the helmet uh, is not intended to protect but maybe the end user thinks that they're able to protect from. All human factors issues uh, that uh, designers and engineers uh, wrestle with all the time in looking at, uh, the, again, the intended purpose of the, of the product and the intended user of that product, whether it's a child or whether it's an uh, adult or a professional, which makes a difference in the use of that product. Well, my time is uh, just about up here. I wanted to see if there's uh, any more uh, questions, last uh, few questions here before uh, we wrap up. Um, I do have some additional questions for you, Will, and I do encourage um, all of our attendees to submit their questions through the chat feature. This is an opportunity for Will to be able to answer any of your specific questions. The first question I have is, um, it does seem that human factors analysis generally concludes that the person is not at fault. Does a human factors analysis ever conclude that the product was properly designed the instructions were clear, and the proper warnings were included. Oh, yes, most definitely. Uh, yes, yeah, there uh, um, tends to be uh, kind of a perception that uh, whenever human factors, uh, professionals analyze a situation, that it's never the person's fault, uh, and that's just simply not, not the case. Um, the humans uh, play a very important role in the overall system, uh, and um, the training becomes important. Again, the intended use of that product uh, and how that uh, product is used. Um, and the person uh, has to be able to use that product and not be, uh, you know, using alcohol or being on drugs or a host of other things that are being uh, distracted. Uh, they can affect the, the user and how they use a the product, and they obviously uh, have accountability and responsibility uh, for uh, the use of that product uh, in the appropriate setting. So, oh, um, it's, you see that uh, regularly where the, the person is uh, also uh, contributory to the uh, end results of uh, the incident happening. Okay, and you use the examples of the nail gun and also the trampoline. Um, are there specific standards for these types of products and whether they would be intended for, uh, say, personal use for, or consumer use versus commercial use? Where would one go to find those standards uh, if they had a, a question about a product design or if, in fact, it met the standards? Well, when it comes to, uh, like, a nail gun, um, the... Um it would depend on the specific aspects of that nail gun of what types of standards or regulations that we would be talking about. I'd need to know more specifics about that. Uh, when it comes to the trampoline, uh, I think, wasn't that the second one, Carol, was the trampoline? Yes, yeah, so that was the second example. Yeah. And that would be, I, for example, a con commute, you know, consumer use of a trampoline, say, like in someone's backyard. Yeah, um, I'm not aware of any particular 
standards. There might be, uh, for trampoline, uh, some industry standards. Um, but a lot of times when you look at industry standards, it's made up of the manufacturers of the product itself. And a lot of times, to be real honest, uh, those standards are not very um, stringent. And they do not uh, generally uh, stretch the designers, engineers, and manufacturers to really engineer out products as much as they look at uh, strictly warning about the product itself. So I'm not saying that that's the case with trampolines. We'd have to look into it. I'm not aware, though, from the work that we've done over the years uh, of specific safety standards of trampolines that um, uh, governmental bodies have gotten into. Okay, and I do have a, a question, um, and this is actually in the area of transportation. Do they ever, or is human factors ever used in deciding where crosswalks or lights should be placed um, on highways or streets, uh, or is it more just an engineering decision? No, human factors is a, uh, plays a key role into that. Now, there are... Uh, general guidelines that uh, codes have uh, adopted based off of, um, uh, you know, the streets and setbacks for sidewalks and the timing of those lights and how much time you have to walk across the street, things like that. But it's all based off of human factor study. Uh, but there are many situations out there where uh, you have to look at the uniqueness of the situation and the application of human factors that, uh, the uh, codes may not specifically address and would have to look at that individually on how uh, that setup should be done to incorporate uh, proper human factors analysis. Okay, and then this is an additional question. Are there regulations that require human factors analysis as part of product development? Uh, yes. Uh, depending on the industry, Again, I mentioned earlier that when you look at medical devices, uh, it's required that you have uh, some human factors analysis uh, on the product itself. Uh, a lot of industries uh, have general guidelines of looking at from a human factor standpoint, but in most cases, it's really up to the engineering group to reach out and look at the product from a human factor standpoint. Uh, as opposed to any specific uh, standards or regulations. Again, I mentioned earlier about the hierarchy of engineering at out, guard against, warn about. Uh, that's a pretty standard hierarchy to use. Uh, OSHA uh, uses that, and uh, good product designers and engineers will also look at that uh, hierarchy and uh, identify the hazards and try to follow that hierarchy. It's good standard pro practice. Okay, and we have another question from Robin, and Robin asks, um, regarding the placement of fire extinguishers in businesses, are there standards as to the placement of the fire extinguishers and safety harnesses of cabinets to be used? Um, th there are uh, standards required for factories really to uh, general placement of fire extinguishers and the signing so that people can find those fire extinguishers. Uh, the codes tend to be very uh, varied as far as cabinets and the type of enclosure and if any protection is required of that fire extinguisher. So it would depend uh, on the specific situation. But generally, the, the codes are more... Uh, uh, far as the general location and that the area has to be cleared for access to get to it as opposed to the particular uh, cabinet that it goes into. But you have to know more about it, whether it's an office environment, whether it's a factory, whether it's a warehouse, and um, where that specific one would be and what codes would be uh, applicable. Fire codes tend to be very city-oriented. Uh, okay, and I have an additional question. Um, what information do you look for when first investigating a product liability case? Say that again, Carol. Sure. What information do you look for when first investigating a product liability case? 
Um, well, if uh, it depends on the phase of the uh, lawsuit of whether it's pre-litigation or whether it's in the middle of uh, discovery. If it's uh, pre-litigation, sometimes we'll get uh, called in to assist an attorney on whether to even take on a case or not. We would uh, uh, basically look at just either whether it's a statement from uh, the injured party uh, and uh, analyze the product itself, look at the manual that's associated with the product or instructions, and try to understand uh, more of a cursory or more of a broad brush approach of what the issues are. Generally, though, we get in, uh, involved uh, in the middle of discovery, and you have uh, you know, depositions, medical records, uh, interrogatories, photographs, do a site inspection or get the product in and, and analyze it, and then uh, look at what uh, codes, regulations, standards uh, apply to that product. And then look and uh, understand exactly how that product was used in that situation. And then uh, uh, go through a, we didn't talk about it today, there was a slide that skipped over. Go through either like a root cause analysis where you really start to understand exactly what occurred and how it occurred. Some cases it's a situation where it's a snowball effect, whether it was one small error or, uh, that took place and that led to another decision that was an error, uh, led to a bigger decision that was a bigger error, and then ultimately led to the incident itself. Um, so uh, we uh, look at a variety of the documents uh, and photographs, and uh, the product itself, though, is very important to have so that we can see if the product itself is uh, been maintained properly or is defective in some form or fashion, um, as well as, uh, again, the testimony of the user or witnesses of what happened. Uh, and um, so we can look at that system of the person, the product, and the environment that it was used and uh, determine the cause of, of the incident. Okay. Thank you very much, Well, That seems to be the end of our questions. Uh, for today, and um, I want to thank you very much for your time and your effort in this presentation. Uh, we will be, uh, as I said earlier, we will uh, be sending a link with the presentation to all of the attendees, and um, if you want to reach or get in touch with Will, you can certainly give Tasa a call here uh, at 1-800-523-2319. For those of you um, who are looking for CLE uh, um, certification, please, again, be sure to complete the survey at the end of the presentation. This webinar is eligible for CLE credit in Illinois, New Jersey, Missouri, and Texas, and it is also pending approval in Minnesota. Again, I thank you very much uh, for attending, and just as uh, in our closing, I'd like to um, make all of you aware that we do also now offer um, research reports on expert witnesses and also e-discovery and document management solutions for those who might have any interest. Again, thank you again for attending and um, have a great day.